sustainable without even having to care for saying anything. And that's why the focus on the public is crucially important. Almost as much as my <laughs> All right, learned something today. Now, Tom, was Yoda your first Star Wars role? No. Uh, I first started doing uh, just miscellaneous Star Wars characters uh, in the mid 90s when video games were brand new. Um, uh, Lucas had just started a game division called Lucas Arts, which is now gone. It's now folded into Lucas Animation. Um, and uh, actually, uh, as I heard the story, uh, that he, George was concerned with the first video game that Lucas did. Uh, not be a Star Wars property in case it was. He didn't, he didn't want it to be a Star Wars thing if it came out that way. Um, so the first thing that Lucas did was a, uh, a game called The Dig, uh, which had nothing whatsoever to do with anything that came before or after, really. Um, so that was the first thing I worked on. I didn't remember what I did, just a couple of miscellaneous lines. And, uh, but the next game they did it was a Star Wars property. So uh, since the director knew that I did a bunch of voices and stuff, he brought me in for whatever it was, X-Wing versus TIE Fighter or something back in the 90s. And I was just doing, you know, TIE Fighter pilot number two. Uh, you know, uh, and they would have, they would have back then, I'm sure, really enjoyed having the original cast members, you know, reprise their voices. But, just physically it couldn't be done because all of them were in England. And they were recording this in California, Los Angeles. And at that time, there, the technology did not exist to record stuff across the pond without hiring a recording studio in London, having them come in, record it, and then literally mailing it from the UK to the United States. It, it just was. That's how it had to be done, which was all awkward and expensive and slow. And you, you told me that now they have technology that you can actually be oh, yeah. in, in your house oh. and make it sound like you're actually in a room. Oh yeah, no, I have a studio in my home. I, I, I can hook up to any major recording studio on the planet and it's instantaneous and the quality is the same as if I was there in their studio and, and it's live. Do you get paid the same? Uh, Usually, I think, but <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was for several years uh, the voice of Disney Asia, and so I'd be doing sessions at nine o'clock at night on on Wednesday, and talking to people in Singapore who, for them, it was the next morning and the day ahead. So I was always laughing about them talking to the future, but. Uh, yeah, it just uh, it, it just works that way. But back then, they, they didn't have any of this, so it, it made no economic sense for them to just do a character that has three lines uh, and go go to all that trouble and expense. So they were just finding people that could kind of mimic the voices in the movies, and I was one of those guys. So uh, what happened was a couple of years after that, I'd probably done five or ten different games, and. One of the things, you know, most of the people, we were constantly, we read everything. I mean, you know, we'll be in the grocery store and I'll be walking down the aisle and I'll go, what's the plates there? Great! You know, we can take some fun. And um, so, you know, when we're looking at scripts and we have other characters on scripts, sometimes we'll, like, we'll read other characters. It's kind of a way of practicing, you know. So I, w I was sitting there staring, actually, it started on the C3PO. I, I had some 3 po lines, which I assumed the enemy would do. Um, but again, I wasn't realizing that it was in the UK. So I was doing that. What I didn't know was that, again, all the, how difficult it was to get the people in the UK to do a few lines. And um, I get booked a week later, and it's as C3PO. And apparently, well, they recorded what I had done, taken them like it for George, and they gave a thumbs up. And from that point on, I was C3PO for anything that he didn't want to do or couldn't do, and I still am. Um, you know, a lot of stuff in the parks uh, and uh, toys and stuff like that. It's it's actually me and not him. It's just a game. You know, if there's enough money involved, he'll do it. <laughs> they go to CPA 2.0. But, uh, yes, I, I, I just can't. Uh, <laughs> I 
to you, you know, human sidewalk relations. And this is my car. Uh, shut up, Arthur, I'm talking. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, uh, and then about a year later, the exact same thing happened again with Yoda. I was reading Yoda lines, just playing around while they were getting set up. And what I didn't know was Frank Oz was in New York directing the movie Three Men and Baby. And Frank had become a fairly successful fledgling director at that time. And now he's a very successful director. He's, I believe, been nominated for an Oscar a couple of times. Um, and, you know, once you've been nominated for Academy Awards as a director, you generally don't go back to being a voiceover for a puppet for another director. It's generally they do that too well. So he just was unavailable. And I, same thing happened. And the director told me my, my entire audition to get Yoda 18 years ago was he walked into a, the director walked into George's office with a, a Walkman, a cassette Walkman, press play, and it was me reading some of the Yoda lines. I didn't even know I was being recorded. I would have done better if I had known I was supposed to play. And George's entire response to our audition was, yeah, he sounds good, use him. <laughs> and that was 18 years ago, and I've done most of the Yoda you've heard since. Now, you both were involved in The Force Awakens. Um, Tim, we'll talk, we'll talk to you first about this. So, what was it like for you to reprise your role as Admiral Ackbar after all these years? It was a very strange feeling because um, there were an awful lot of uh, young people working on the, the film, all the uh, stormtroopers and rebels and all that, the extras were mainly the young 20. And I can honestly say that I've never walked onto a set before and had to do so much signing. <laughs> Every time I would show up on set, somebody would bring up their book or something. Oh, can you just sign this for me? Can you just sign that for me? And so that, that was a very strange feeling to be um, treated, treated special, I guess, on the movie set. <laughs> That's never happened to me before. Get over here now. Yeah, that's, that's the usual thing. So it was, it was really nice. It was, I, I had a lot of fun um, playing around with people when I was in the costume. Just because I can look out the right nostril. And it was, it's nice to see that uh, getting so excited because you're talking. You know, so that was really fun. That's really how you can see out of his right nostril. <laughs> now I'm going to go look it up. Both, both of your eyes look out the right nostril? Yes, that's correct. I'm so going to Google it. Were there a lot of changes to the outfit from Return of the Jedi to The Force Awakens? I mean, in Return of the Jedi, did you look out the right nostril there as well? I also looked out the right nostril, but um, in those days, the animatronics um, were simpler than they are now. And so we had the full body suit costume that I wore, but I also built a hand puppet close up version of Akbar. And um, I was inside of Akbar's chest. My head was inside of his chest. And I operated his mouth puppet style. And my friend Mike Quinn, who was also a nine now, then did all the cable controls for his eyes. On the Force Awakens, of course, we come forward by 30 years and all the servos have gotten smaller. So I would uh, equate it more to putting your head into a cage of 30 live budgies because you're surrounded by servos all twittering and cheeping as they move all the muscles of the face and everything. <laughs> so it's a, um, a combination of sensory deprivation and uh, oral torture. <laughs> It's, it's not the sort of job that everybody would choose to do. You have to sort of have a certain level of masochistic enjoyment to want to do these things in the first place. As any of the guys at the back of the room in their costumes can tell you. <laughs> no, no claustrophobia. Oh, I, I actually, I do suffer from claustrophobia. I'm okay when I'm performing, but when you're just there on the side of set, uh, at one time I was there for 45 minutes. Due to the fact, all right, I'm going to lose my house over this one. Carrie wasn't getting a line right. Really? And Harrison, 25 takes, he was doing a different take of his line, 25 takes. 
but they had to go over and over and over again. So I'm sitting there in the dark with my earpiece in, listening to this going on. <laughs> it was like listening to a radio play, you know, but uh, in English for me. Now, one thing I want to carry on with that story. <laughs> I wanted to know, in fact, uh, from, from back when you did the originals to, to now, do they have some kind of system now, that, a cooling system of some kind to keep people not, you know, because I know that uh, Anthony, especially when they were doing the Tatooine sequences, Anthony would just pass out occasionally. Uh, but it's some, I think it was Peter, Peter told me that they have, for some of the costumes, they have some kind of fluid or something in there to keep people from passing out. Uh, from heat exhaustion, is there anything like that? You can you can choose to wear a um, cold cool suit. It has a, it's a whole series of tools that are stitched into a, a thin cotton outfit. But those have to be plugged in to an ice chest so they can cool you down in between takes. But you can't do it while you're actually performing. I personally, coming from the from the old school. Uh, just believe that you drink loads of water and you go up to the right temperature and then you stay there until you come out again. Uh, they have uh, cordless Makita air blowers that they can stuff in your mouth and just give you fresh air. The biggest problem is that you're, you're breathing your own carbon monoxide quite often, so you, you pass out as much from that as from the <laughs> But uh, not to mention the brain damage, but other yeah, <laughs> it explains a lot about that. Uh, <laughs> funny enough, the only time I had a problem, it, it wasn't on Star Wars, it was for one of the things for Jim, uh, Jim Henson. And we, I, I'd come out of the suit, and the set was so hot, they decided to open the main stage door, and it was about 40 degrees outside and it was about 95 degrees in the studio and when they opened the stage door the cold air came in and it hit my back and my muscles contracted so quickly that I tore my own muscles out of my back and ended up flat on the floor and getting a free trip to hospital and that was because I, I just cooled down too quickly I was fine up to the point when they opened the door and cooled me down <laughs> Uh, when when working on Force Awakens, did it feel like Star Wars? Oh, very much so. The, the wonderful thing, I mean, because these days, so much of what you end up doing is being done. This, the little green ball on the pole over there is the other character being drawn up in California at the moment. You know, and um, on this one, JJ had everything built. I mean, the wonderful sets and stuff, which didn't even make it into the finished cut of the film. But they were all really there, you know. We, we got all the extras standing there in the shots. We didn't just take five people and then repeat them repeatedly to make 3,000, you know. So it, it was very much the full environment, which was wonderful. That's what I heard. I heard a lot of people say that The Force Awakens really had that Star Wars feel to it, mm -hmm. much more so than the prequels did with all of the CGI and all that stuff and, and that for the actors. Um, now, Tom, what, what did you do in The Force Awakens? Well, as is normal with voiceover stuff, usually they bring people like me in when it's pretty much finished, or certainly well along in post-production. Um, because, you know, there's, especially in a movie like this, there are dozens and dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of characters that are there on the set, that are there on the screen, but there's just absolutely no way, uh, there's just many, many reasons why you can't actually have the people that are on the set deliver lines, because then you, you know, they're all in helmets. They, you'd have to mic them somehow, and it would sound hollow and terrible. Uh, so all the lines you hear that come out of stormtroopers or, or pretty much anybody that's in any kind of alien costume, those are all done after the fact. Now, they may have uttered them on the set, but they don't use that on the Go back in and, and they do it afterwards. So the quality is good. Um, so what we do uh, is, uh, if, it, it's a, if it's a big celebrity like you know Daniel Craig, 
James Bond, who was one of the stormtroopers. Uh, we all know what happened. Have him or her come in and, and do their own line, their lines. Uh, but for most of them, uh, the, you know, the sort of miscellaneous characters, they'll just bring uh, four or five guys in and four or five women, and we just go through the entire movie from front to back. And uh, Matt Wood, who, who does sound for all of the Lucasfilm stuff for a long time, he'll just sit there with us and all of a sudden be like, okay, stop. And there'll be like, you know, there'll be something in the movie that Kylo Ren is saying something to a stormtrooper, and the stormtrooper, oh, I don't know if he responds or not, I can't hear anything. So what does he say Just to Kylo Ren? Well, sometimes they have it scripted, and they're like, okay, you say, yeah, you know, you know, sir, they went that way. And, uh, so Matt will go, okay, uh, Tom, uh, James, and you know, whoever, you guys each read that. And we'll each do it like three times. And, uh, and we do that to every, every character that doesn't have a voice but needs one. We'll, we'll, and you know, Matt will just pick a woman and say, do, do three takes of that or three takes of this. And it all ends up going to J.J. Abrams and post-production, you know, literally, J.J. is very hands-on, uh, apparently, and you know, he'll sit there and he'll listen to every single take from every single guy to try it, and then he'll go, that one. He doesn't even know what it is. He doesn't care, but that one. That's that stormtrooper. Um, so, I, you know, and we all must have read 25 different characters in the movie each, and uh, you know, we'll end up with three or four that, that we actually end up in the movie with. I, I was a, I think a stormtrooper, and I was a voice coming out of uh, the PA system on, on the Bosnian Prime, and the new Death, the new Death, not the Death Star, but the uh, Star Code is something, yeah, uh, you know. <laughs> did, you did something for, did you get the Bosnian Prime? Uh, my, my, um, Bosnian ambassador or something, it's, it's the old gentleman on the, he's on the balcony when the blast wave from the weapon is, is coming toward him and he steps forward and he goes, Hey, what is it? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but, uh, yeah, so, it, you know, it just, people were asking me before I knew for sure, like, well, what voices did you do it in? I don't know. I could have done one, I could have done 20, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see what it comes but the cool part is the credits at the end. It's like, I'm dead sent. <laughs> My kids saw it before I did. They're all nudging me. I'm like, what? What? Well, I'm done. They're like, oh, I missed it. <laughs> but so you actually get to see a lot of the movie. Well, yeah, but I didn't want to. Uh, honestly, there were several of us. Uh, there were Clone Wars actors uh, that they brought in to do some of the voices on, on the F7. And, uh, we, from the minute they started rolling the, the film, uh, we, we were just like, ah, 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 ah. Yeah. I, I don't, because we're like, I don't want to see this. Because it's, you're in a small sound, sound stage that's maybe half the size of this room, and the print is black and white. Well, it's not a print, it's a digital projection, but it's in black and white. They're, the effects, what few there were, were, were half done. The effects weren't fully rendered. They stripped all the dialogue out of the main characters. So, you know, Han Solo pops on the screen and goes, <laughs> and, and I'm kind of a half-ass good reading lips, but not that good. So you do get a vague idea because it was well edited. You, you can kind of figure out what's going on and if you're watching this, but it's like, you, you know, I would catch myself going, oh, I can tell, and then I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to know. So I literally sat there the entire time everybody's doing this, and I was just playing crosswords on my, my iPhone until, you know, someone would say, okay, Tom, let's do this one. And I would do it and sit down. So I successfully managed to miss about 75% of the movie. And I'm glad to, because I wanted to see it on the screen. I would, I would like to say the secrecy on this movie was so great. And it worked out nicely, like you say, because you want to see it like yeah. one of the people that get to see it in the cinema. And the secrecy was so great that I was sitting there in the cinema and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my God, they killed Han Solo. 
I worked on the movie and I didn't know that. <laughs> wow, so same, with, same with us. They, that scene was cut out of our print. Yeah, to make sure. They, they, again, secrecy, even for, I mean, I've been working for them for 20 years and they stopped. Yeah, I've never told them again. And they stopped, you know, they used to, in the early days, would, would send me uh, scripts that, you know, they still have my name watermarked on every page so that if something shows up on the internet, they'll know where it came from. And uh, they would only send me my pages, nothing else, so I didn't even know what the heck was going on. Well, as the years went by, they like obviously I wasn't doing anything, so it got the point for you know in the last six or seven years they don't seem to care. They just send me a script, you know, just send me stuff, and they trust me that I'm not gonna, you know, I, that I will shred it and that I will take care of it. But even in this case, they were like, no, they wouldn't send me anything. And, uh, and like I said, when, even when we were all there, we all signed all the paperwork that they were, you know. Around your puppies and kittens, if you don't know. Uh, it still didn't matter. They, they, that scene and several other key scenes were just removed. And we, the, some of the voices they needed, we just had to record it. And Matt would say, okay, we need to say this, and it has to be 2.2 seconds. Well, where's it going? Don't worry about it. <laughs> you don't need to know. You don't need to know. It's kind of hard working on stuff without 